Maharaj received a second initiation. He has been preaching for over the last 25 years in Asian countries such as India, the Philippines, Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, Malaysia, and Thailand. Through his years of preaching, he has given countless souls like guidance and deep inspiration. <laughs> in Shida Mayapur in the year 1994, from his Solanas Tamal Krishna Gosai Maharaj, did not mean much of a change in his lifestyle, since Maharaj has always been strict in his sadhana. Whoever gets to know Maharaj admires and respect his sincere and faithful practice of chanting the holy names of the Lord. He truly walks his talk. <laughs> Maharaj has been teaching with the Mayapur Institute and also guiding many devotees from Damodradesh and Gauravadesh Yatra. And we are very fortunate to hear from Maharaj the Krishna Katha. Thank you, Maharaj, for uh, accept accept accepting our invitation and joining with us. And before that, uh, I request uh, His Grace Sadhika Pati Prabhu, can you please offer a garland to Maharaj? A virtual garland. Yes, sorry, Maharaj. Yes, sorry, Maharaj. Bhakti Vikta Vinasana Sivasana Maharaj. Jai Ki Chai. Prabhupada Ki Chai. Jai Ho. Hari Hari Bo. Hari Bo. Thank you. Good. Thank you for that very nice garland. <laughs> very happy to have the association of the devotees. Okay, we can begin. Om Magyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshur Militanyena Tesmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Katamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Bandeham Shri Gara Shri Yadapada Kamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavam Stya Shri Rupam Sakrajatam Sahagana Raganatan Vitam Tam Sajevam Sadvaitam Sabadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakanitam Stya He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagadpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Dapta Kanchana Gauranke Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavan Ebyo Vaishnavibyo Namo Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Precharine Nirvishesha Shunyavari Paschatya Deshatarine Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasade Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So it's a very auspicious time in the year. Of course we're uh, this is the month of Shravan and we're approaching in a couple of days it will be Purnima, Balaram Purnima. So it's certainly a time for festivals and Vaishnava festivals are very very important for us as devotees. 
Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur in his uh, songs, in his Sharanagati, he's describing uh, Anukul Yasha Sankalpa, Pratikul Yasha Varjanam, accepting what things we should accept for devotional service. So in his song Shuddha Bhakata, he's described Madhavatiti Bhakti Janani, Yatani, like that, Madhavatiti Bhakti Janani, that by observing the holy days, such as Ikarasi and Janmastami, then it becomes a mother of devotion for those devotees who take shelter of them. So we want to increase our devotion. It's very good for us to take shelter of these festivals and really absorb ourselves in the festivals which are appearing on our Vaishnava calendar and particularly this coming festival of Balaram Purnima and then Sri Krishna Janmastami. They're very, very important. Then of course we have Radhastami. So these are very, very major festivals in the year for us. And of course then the day after Janmastami we have our own uh, Srila Prabhupada Avirbhav Mahotsava, this Vyasa Puja festival. So that's also very, very important for all of us. So taking part in the birth of Lord Krishna, right? The appearance of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The Lord comes. The Lord is coming for His pleasure. And by His pleasure, we also get pleasure. When we see Krishna happy, when we see Krishna enjoying, we also feel pleasure. It's very satisfying to our heart. When we see the Lord, maybe the Lord in his Archavigraha form, or maybe the Lord directly in his different avatars. But when we see that he is properly honored and worshipped, we feel great pleasure in our heart. I was reading in the Srimad Bhagavatam about the appearance of Lord Krishna and it was describing, first of all, how the Lord appeared to Vasudev. Vasudev uh, and Devaki, of course, were held in the prison house of Kamsa and the Lord appeared there as their child. And when the Lord appeared to Vasudev, he, was, he, he saw the Lord in his uh, forearm form. The Lord appeared, it was Vasudev Krishna who appeared there to him, and fully dressed and decorated and ornamented. So Vasudev was overwhelmed with ecstasy. And he could immediately understand that the Supreme Personality of Godhead had appeared to him. So he wanted to observe a festival. The Lord is coming. He, he wanted to have a festival, but he's in the prison house of Kamsa. What can he do for a festival? So within his mind, at least, he arranged a festival. And within his mind, he selected 10,000 cows to offer to qualified brahmanas. When we give charity, it's important to give charity to a qualified person. And this is particularly true when you give cows in charity. You don't want to just give cows to anyone, but we must be sure that the cows are going to be properly cared for and looked after. So Vasudev was very thoughtful about these things and within his mind, he gave in charity 10,000 cows to the brahmanas. And then he offered prayers to the Lord. He offered wonderful prayers. Not only did he offer prayers to, to the Lord, but after he had offered prayers, then De Mother Devaki also offered prayers. 
because Vasudev and Devaki are of the same category as Lord Krishna himself. And Brahma Samhita says, Ananda Chanmaya Rasa Pratibhavitabhis Tabiri Eva Nijarupa Kaya Kalabi Goloka Eva Sati Nakilatma Bhutto Govindam Adipursham Tamaham Bajami that all of the different paraphernalia and the associates of the Lord, they're all of the same spiritual potency. So Vasudev and Devaki are very great souls, of course they have to be. They performed austerities to get the Lord as their child for three births. And the third birth was in the prison house of Lord Kamsa. However, they were not able to perform the birth ceremonies. The birth of a child should be purified by ritualistic purification ceremonies. But uh, the, the jati karma could not be done, the jata karma rituals couldn't be done in the prison house of Kamsa. Rather, Vasudev by the arrangement of Yoga Maya, he took the child, of course, to the home of Nanda Maharaj. And it was in Goku, in the home of Nanda Maharaj, where the Jata Karma rituals were performed. Uh, our Acharya, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, he gives a lot of evidence from scriptures to establish that Krishna is actually the child of Nanda Maharaj and Mother Yashoda. He's not just only the child of Vasudev and Devaki, but he's the child of Nanda Maharaj and Yashoda. And the child who appeared, you know, by the arrangement of Yoga Maya, Kamsa could come out of the jail and bring Krishna to the home of Nanda Maharaj and exchange the child. And he took away the girl who had been born to Mother Yashoda. Because Mother Yashoda didn't just give birth to one child, but there was Shamsundar Krishna as well as Yoga Maya or Subhadra. So Vasudev took away this uh, girl who was born to Nanda Maharaj and took her back to the prison house. And then the two boys, there's Shamsundar Krishna and Vasudev Krishna, they become one. The Vasudev form of Krishna enters into the Shamsundar form of Krishna. And Nanda Maharaj then performs the ritualistic ceremonies because how to perform uh, Krishna Avirbhav Mahotsava, you have to have a big festival and you have to be very pure. Actually, before we can perform the Krishna Janmastami, we first of all have to observe the birth appearance of Lord Balaram. So very significant that before Krishna appeared, Lord Balaram appeared, eight days before Lord Krishna. I think this sun this Sunday we will celebrate the appearance, the Avirbhav Mahotsava of Lord Balaram. Lord Balaram is non different from Lord Krishna. Oh, only difference anyway in colour. Krishna is the blackish sham Krishna and Balaram is white colour. But otherwise they're the same. But there is a difference in the mood because Lord Balaram comes in the mood of the servant of Lord Krishna. He comes to serve Krishna. Although he's not different from Krishna and although he's the older brother of Lord Krishna, he comes to serve Krishna. Why should he come as the older brother? It is explained that in previous incarnation, the Lord had come, Lord Balaram had come as a younger brother. 
in the pastimes of Lord Rama, Lakshman was there. And Lakshman was always desiring to serve Lord Rama. But Lord Rama was very strict with him. He would not allow Lakshman to make a lot of arrangements for his service. He would not accept a lot of the service which Lakshman gave. It became very difficult for Lakshman. So Lakshman thought it's so difficult to be the younger brother because as the younger brother, he has to listen to the older brother. He has to take instructions and he cannot just go about doing what he likes for his pleasure. And so Lord Lakshman decided in future incarnations, I won't come as a younger brother, I'll come as the older brother. And so therefore, with Krishna avatar, first of all comes Lord Balaram. And Lord Balaram appears in the womb of Devaki. It's the seventh pregnancy of Devaki. Lord Krishna was the eighth pregnancy and Balaram appeared there in the womb of Devaki as the seventh pregnancy. He appears also in the prison house of Kamsa. But he doesn't remain there. He comes there for some time and he makes arrangements for Lord Krishna to come. He knows that next Lord Krishna is going to come there, so he wants to make nice arrangements. His mood is to give service. And so he makes arrangements that Lord Krishna is going to come into the womb of Devaki. There must be nice arrangements made. And he stayed there for some time, and then it was arranged that Devaki apparently had a miscarriage. At that time, actually, by the help of Yoga Maya, Lord Balaram was transferred into the womb of Devaki, or rather into the womb of Rohini, who was another wife of Vasudeva. Now Rohini was already pregnant at that time, so Lord Balaram entered into the womb also. Lord Balaram entered into the womb and it appeared like Devaki had had a miscarriage. Actually, when Lord Balaram was transferred by Lord Yoga Maya into the womb of Rohini, he left his expansion of Ananta Shesha there. Ananta Shesha serves Lord Krishna as a bed. Lord Krishna is going to come into the womb of Devaki, there should be some bed, there should be some comfortable place for him to lay down. So Ananta Shesha remained there in the womb of Devaki so that he could be the bed for Lord Krishna when he will come there. So in this way, uh, Balaram appears before Lord Krishna. He went to the womb of Rohini and Rohini was already staying at the home of Nanda Maharaj. Vasudeva was worried about her safety. So he had, Vasudeva had several wives, so he had Rohini sent to the home of Nanda Maharaj for her own safety because he knew that Kamsa is persecuting and performing many atrocities. He'd already had his six sons killed by Kamsa and he didn't want to see another child killed by Kamsa. So he sent Rohini secretly over to the home of Nanda Maharaj. And this was a great advantage actually because when Lord Krishna appears in the home of Nanda Maharaj, then Lord Krishna and Balaram can be together and they can perform their wonderful pastimes in the forest of Vrindavan with the cowherd boys and they also have their pastimes with the gopis. So it's very convenient, Lord Krishna and Balaram together because Balaram always wants to serve Krishna. So he likes to be with Lord Krishna. So it's important for us to understand 
the significance of the appearance of Lord Balaram. That in order for us to properly appreciate the appearance of Lord Krishna, we have to first of all get the blessings of Lord Balaram. Lord Balaram is the Adi Guru. He's the original spiritual master. And all other spiritual masters are coming as in the line from Lord Balaram. Lord Balaram is very important for all of us because by the mercy of Lord Balaram we can remove the anarthas from our heart. Within our heart we have many anarthas, particularly there is anarthas due to Ridaya Durbalyam, which is the weakness of the heart. The weakness of the heart means we do things like fault-finding and criticizing and lazy, not being steady in our devotional service. Sometimes we're active, sometimes we're not. We're up and down, our sadhana is on off. It's not very steady. It's not like Dridavrat, you know, it's not like we have fixed determination. So this Ridaya Durbalyam, this weakness of the heart, is a very serious anatta, and by the mercy of Lord Balaram, this can be removed. Another, there are other anartas, we'll just mention them briefly. For example, Asat Trishna, desires for material things. Sometimes we want position, we want distinction, adoration, we want profit, we want material facilities. So this is Asat Krishna, this is another anartha. And then another anartha is due to offences. There are different kinds of offences or apparats. We say there's seva apparat, which means offences in relation to our deity worship. Our deity worship may not be done properly, our mood is not right, or we're not clean or we're not regular, we're not punctual, these different kinds of offences are there. And then there's also Nam Aparad, there's offences in chanting the holy name. Usually every day we like to recite the ten offences in chanting the holy name. So it's important for us to really endeavour to chant the holy name feelingly from the heart. And chanting the holy name will help us to overcome offences which we perform in the worship of the deities. We shouldn't think that by worshipping the deities we are exempt from chanting the holy name. Not at all. Rather, on the contrary, when we take on the worship of the deities we have a deeper obligation to chant the holy name because the chanting of the Holy Name is what's going to protect us from offences in worshipping the Deity. Another apparat comes in the, worship, in the dealings with devotees, Vaishnava apparat. Well, it's a very serious offence. Of course, that's the first offence in chanting the Holy Name, to blaspheme the devotees who have dedicated their lives to propagating the Holy Name. So we have to be very careful in dealing with devotees. And there's also offences to other living entities. We must deal very, deal very carefully and respectfully with all living entities and understand that Krishna is in the heart of everyone. So these are the different anartas which are there. And because of the presence of anartas, that's why we cannot have a pure heart for the worship of Krishna. And if we want to celebrate Krishna Janmastami, we have to purify the heart. 
So how are we going to purify that heart? We have to get the mercy of Lord Balaram. This is why Lord Balaram appears, another reason why Lord Balaram appears before Lord Krishna. Because without first approaching Lord Balaram, we cannot approach Krishna. We have to go through Lord Balaram to approach Radha and Krishna. So the appearance of Lord Balaram is a very wonderful opportunity for us to get the mercy of Bal, Lord Balaram. And to, that mercy means to get freed from all these anarthas which are there in our heart. When we get rid of the anarthas in the heart, then Krishna can appear in the heart. We want Krishna to appear in our heart, we have to clean the heart, we have to purify the heart, and that means getting rid of all these anarthas. And that's for the mercy of Lord Balaram. Or we could simply say the mercy of Guru Dev, the mercy of our spiritual master. That by the blessings of our spiritual master, he is non different from Lord Balaram, and we can get the blessings of Lord Balaram. And by that, then we can approach Lord Krishna. So this is very, very important for us. We want to teach everyone. By approaching Lord Balaram, we clean the heart. And when we clean the heart, then we get the blessings of Lord Balaram, which gives us spiritual strength. Lord Balaram is also, he's called different names, right? At the time of the birth, give, birth the name giving ceremony, Gargamuni described Balaram's different that this child will be known as Rama. He will be because he'll give pleasure to everyone. He'll be known as Sankarshan because he's connecting the different families. That although he was coming from the womb of Devaki, he was actually coming into the home of Nanda Maharaj, he was born there in the home of Nanda Maharaj from the womb of Rohini. So he's Sankarshan and he's also Balabhadra. And Bala means very strong. So Lord Balaram is really very, very strong. When we hear about all the, if you just think about all the things which Lord Balaram does, how he's serving Lord Krishna in many different ways. And he has also different forms which are all for the service of Krishna. Forms such as Sankarshan and Anantashesha, and then the three different Purushas Mahavishnu, Garbhodakashayu Vishnu, Shirudakashayu Vishnu. And as Anantashesha, all the different universes are sitting like mustard seeds on his hoods. He's so strong. And all the different incarnations of the Lord, they're appearing from his expansion as Shirodakashai Vishnu. They're all coming from Shirodakashai Vishnu. So Lord Balaram is so powerful, so strong, and he is also giving every living entity spiritual strength. He can give us all spiritual strength, which we need to conquer over the material energy the force of Maya, because Maya is also very strong. Right? Krishna, Lord Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Devi hi esha gunamayi mama maya durajaya. Lord Krishna describes it, this is his Maya, mama maya, my Maya, Lord Krishna says. So the material energy is very powerful. He says, very difficult to overcome. But if one surrenders unto me, he can easily cross beyond it. So how do we surrender? We can surrender to Lord Balaram, who is non-different from Lord Krishna. And Lord Balaram can help us to overcome the attraction of the material energy. 
He can give us that spirit, spiritual strength which is necessary for us to properly worship and honour Lord Krishna. How to do the worship of Lord Krishna? It's so wonderfully described there in the Srimad Bhagavatam. After Vasudev brought child Krishna over to the home of Nanda Maharaj, at that time everyone was asleep. It was in the middle of the night. And Mother Yashoda was asleep due to the labour of giving birth. She was very tired. She didn't know what had happened. Nobody knew. Vasudev had come there and gone. So Nanda Maharaj wakes in the morning and he sees a beautiful child and he's very happy and immediately he organizes the celebration for the birth of the child. Just like after the birth, after the appearance of Lord Krishna at midnight, the next day, that very next day is Nandotsava, right? The, 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 the big festival of Nanda Maharaj. It's not Vasudevotsava, it's Nandotsava. Nanda Maharaj is the one who is very happy because he sees his wife has delivered a wonderful child who is going to be called as Krishna. So how does Nanda Maharaj organize this celebration, festival? Srimad Bhagavatam describes that immediately he called Brahmanas to come and recite Vedic hymns. And there were different people coming. Some would recite the histories from the Puranas. They are called suttas. And then some would recite the histories of different kings and their dynasties. And others would recite general pastimes. Different types of people would come, they could recite these different uh, poems, different songs, different slokas, glorifying the activities of the Lord and the Lord's devotees. Then, Nanda Maharaj arranged different festo uh, different musicians to come. So, and the, and the whole place was decorated very wonderfully. There were flower garlands everywhere, and there was a different gateways made using cloth and flower garlands. Srimad Bhagavatam describes that at the time of the birth of Lord Krishna, although Lord Krishna was, he appeared in the midnight, usually at that time flowers like the lotus and the lily, they're all closed. But with the birth of Lord Krishna, because it was so, such an auspicious occasion, they, they were open. And the, the lotus and the lilies, they were open. So there was a beautiful fragrance from all of these flowers everywhere, pervading the whole place. There was beautiful aroma, so many different fragrant flowers. And of course, when Lord Krishna appeared, there was a very, very auspicious arrangement of all the stars and the planets. The, the, the constellation known as Rohini was also there and different stars like uh, Ajita, Ajita was also present. Everything was very auspicious. There was nothing inauspicious. The, it was not very hot. Although it was the month of Shravan, it's September, it's usually hot, it's still hot. But on the time of Lord Krishna, it was just like spring. It was not cold, but it was cool. So everything was so pleasant, everything was so perfectly arranged just for the appearance of Lord Krishna. This of course is Lord Krishna's different potencies, his different uh, pastime potencies, they would arrange everything like this for his birth. So Nanda Maharaj, seeing his wife has got a beautiful child, 
Then all the people in Vrindavan, all the village people, they all hear that Mother Yashoda has delivered a child, a boy named Krishna. So everybody's happy, it's a festival, and everybody wants to come and give blessings and to see the child. And when they come, they don't come empty-handed. Just like when we go to temple, we shouldn't go empty-handed. In the very beginning of our movement, the, the devotees hadn't the arrangement because Prabhupada had explained that actually coming to the temple, we shouldn't come empty-handed. So the devotees would keep a big sack of rice at the door and everyone would take a little palmful of grains of rice and when they came into the temple, they would offer the palmful of grains of rice to the deities and bow down. They were so conscious that they wanted to follow the different rules and regulations for the pleasure of the Lord. And especially this is true on the appearance of Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna, when he appeared, even I remember myself as a child, whenever someone would have a baby, I would remember my mother would go and she would always give something, she would have to give something, you give some envelope with some money in it, you make some presentation to them, give something for the welfare of the child. So, similarly the people of Vrindavan, and the people of Vrindavan, of course, they're all pure devotees, they're all Krishna's eternal associates, the gopis and the gopas, and they all come to see Lord Krishna. And Srimad Bhagavatam describes the opulence which was in Vrindavan at that time. How opulent Vrindavan was. All the people would come, they'd be so nicely dressed. The men would be wearing jackets and turbans, and the women would have wonderful, beautiful golden ornaments and beautiful cloth, silk and nice jewelries. Although they were just farming people, village people, they were not poor, rather they were the wealthiest people. And when they came to see Lord Krishna, they didn't come empty-handed. They brought their offerings with them. They brought on a gold plate, they would bring different things to offer to, Lord, to the baby. They would bring grains and cloth and jewels. Just like when Nanda Maharaj saw that his wife had given birth to a child, he gave charity also. We told Vasudev he was in prison, so he gave charity in his mind. Now giving charity in his mind is all right, but if you have the means to do it physically, we should do it. We shouldn't think, oh, I'm, I'm, I will just give charity in my mind. We shouldn't be miserly when it comes to offering charity and offering gifts for the service of the Lord. We shouldn't think, oh, I'll do my puja in my mind because I'm too tired today. No, we should take the necessary trouble for the service of Krishna. There may be times where it's difficult to do things physically, all right, but if we have the opportunity, it's certainly better that we do it physically. So Vasudev was in prison house, he didn't have the opportunity, so mentally he did his charity, he had his festival for the worship, for the birth of Lord Krishna. Nanda Maharaj, however, he's able to physically do it. And what does he do? Srimad Bhagavatam describes that Nanda Maharaj gave two million cows in charity. Two million cows he gave in charity to Brahmanas for the birth of Lord Krishna, in honor of the birth of Lord Krishna. Of course, it's inconceivable to our limited mind and senses. Two million cows, even if we hear somebody has a herd of 500 cows, we think, oh my goodness. But here we have Nanda Maharaj 
giving two, thou, two, two million cows in charity. So he's, he still had many more. And he didn't just give cows only. He also, there were, it describes there were seven hills of grains. And each hill of grains was covered with jewels and costly necklaces. And then there was cloth with gold embroidery. And in this way, Nanda Maharaj was giving the highest charity. And he would offer these gifts. He would give charity to everyone on the occasion of Lord Krishna's birth. No one was refused. Everyone was given some kind of charity. Not to, he didn't just say, oh no, this is only for brahmanas. He gave to everyone. He was willing to give charity to everyone. Because he was so happy, he was so ecstatic. After a long time, Mother Yashoda has delivered a child. He'd wanted, they'd wanted a child for a long time and they had no child. Then finally, finally, after a long time, they were on their out, not so young, and so they were so fortunate. Usually a couple is elderly, they won't get a son. But Nanda Maharaj and Mother Yashoda, they got a son. Because Nanda Maharaj and Mother Yashoda, they are always the mother and father of Lord Krishna. Whenever Krishna comes, not only does, he doesn't just come alone, but he comes with his devotees. And Nanda Maharaj and Mother Yashoda, they also come. So Nanda Maharaj gave wonderful charity and all the different gopis who were coming there to visit Lord Krishna also, they would bring their offerings on gold plates, they would make nice presentations to Lord Krishna and then they would offer prayers and they would pray, they would pray to Lord, may you become the king of Braja, may you rule the kingdom of Braja for a long time, like this. They would say some nice, pleasing prayers or blessings, they'd give their blessings for the child. So this is the mood we should have for Janmashtami. We have to approach Lord Krishna, we have to get the blessings of Lord Balaram, purify our heart, and then we can come to Lord Krishna. And when Lord Krishna comes, with the appearance of Lord Krishna on the holy Janmashtami day, we also have to offer prayers and whatever charity we can give, we should give. If we have no money, then we can offer some f fruit or some flower, whatever you can find, even some water is appropriate with tosi, like that. Something we must offer for the pleasure of Lord Krishna. So pleasing Krishna, how do we learn how to properly worship Krishna, we need the grace of our spiritual master. So it's appropriate, I, want to, I, I'm, I can speak a little bit about Srila Prabhupada to you because as we know the day after Janmashtami is the appearance day of His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada and I had the good fortune to be initiated by Srila Prabhupada. I was a very young person at that time, of course. I was 21 when I was initiated. So I've spent 50 years in the Krishna consciousness movement. But when I was initiated, I really didn't know very much. I'd read a small book and I tried to read the big book, Krishna book. I read a small book, I read the uh, topmost yoga system. I'd been looking for a guru. I'd been reading books of different spiritual teachers. I was a searcher. I'd been at university, I studied at university. I graduated, then I was living in London, working in a job there. And at that time, I had the opportunity to purchase my 
book. Before I'd seen books, I'd seen the Back to Godhead a little bit when I was a student. And I chanted Hare Krishna because the devotees had made recordings, like the Hare Krishna mantra and the Govinda. And so I knew this music and I enjoyed that music. But when I went to London and I was living there, working there, that was when I purchased a book and then somehow I got the opportunity to go and visit the temple. And I was going to temple and the devotees were always telling me, Prabhupada is coming, Prabhupada is coming. And I would say, who's Prabhupada? <laughs> and they'd point to his portrait on the Vyasa San and I'd say, oh, oh yeah, him. Oh, he's coming, is he? And they say, yeah, he's coming. And, and, and it would go on like that, week after week, and the weeks became months, and it took several months before Prabhupada came. But finally Prabhupada came, and actually it was appropriate that he came just at the time when it was Janmashtami. So we had the opportunity of celebrating Janmashtami with Srila Prabhupada. And Srila Prabhupada you know, in those days, our, our movement was very basic. In London itself, we were not many devotees. We were about just over 20 devotees, uh, mostly young men, a couple of ladies, a little older. But we had deities. We had, they had established the Radha, Krishna, Radha Landanishwara deities, and we also had Jagannath Baladev Subhadra, quite big size there. So we were worshipping the deities and we were very enthusiastic. So Srila Prabhupada came and we celebrated Janmashtami with him. In London, of course, there's a big Hindu community. So hearing that Srila Prabhupada had come, many Hindu people also came and attended the program, particularly knowing it was Janmashtami, temple was packed, and Srila Prabhupada came and gave the lecture. So many people were thinking that Prabhupada would speak about Krishna Lila, about Krishna's pastimes, maybe even about with the gopis. But Srila Prabhupada never touched that at all. Srila Prabhupada lectured on the philosophy, particularly as described in the fourth chapter of Bhagavad Gita about Lord Krishna's appearance. How the Lord says that uh, although I'm unborn and my transcendental body never deteriorates and I appear in, I, I appear in every millennium. So Prabhupada spoke on these kind of things about Paritranaya Sadunam Vinas Chaitya Duskritam and Dharma Samstarpanartaya, coming to please the devotees, destroy the miscreants and to establish religious principles. Prabhupada was very clear about what he wanted from people and he wanted, he didn't want to just attract followers by speaking about Leela, but Prabhupada wanted to speak the philosophy. It's very important that people will understand this knowledge of Krishna. Right? Tadvidi pranipatena pariprasnena sevaya upadeshyanti te jnanam jnaninas tatvadarshana. So you, we have to hear the topics of Krishna from one who is tatvadarshi from one who has actually seen the truth. And if one has seen the truth, then they should be able to also present it to others in such a manner that others can also see the truth. Sometimes you get people come along who say, oh, I know the truth, but I can't explain it to you. It's, you know, I'm not able to put it into words. So that is not complete knowledge if they cannot explain it. But Srila Prabhupada was not like that. Prabhupada could explain everything very clearly. And he wanted us to learn this philosophy and to present it to others. He wanted us that we should also speak it and 
be able to make it uh, palatable to everyone and present it in a manner in which everyone can understand. And so that was one thing I remembered about Srila Prabhupada, that how he spoke like that, that he, 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 his, his lectures were not made just to attract the public, but he was meant, he was speaking to give knowledge. We say, Om Agyana Timarandasya, Gyananjana Shalakaya, Chaksurun Militanyena, Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha. That we offer our obeisances to the spiritual master who has opened our eyes with the torchlight of knowledge because they were blinded by the darkness of ignorance. So this was Srila Prabhupada. Our eyes were in the darkest of ignorance. I was, you know, materially, you could, I was a university graduate, but I was ignorant. I didn't know anything about spirituality. And so I came from nowhere with, with no knowledge of the culture. But I strongly had the desire to want to learn, to learn everything. And I had the opportunity to become a full-time devotee, came to live in the temple, I gave up my job and lived in the temple with the devotees and practiced Krishna consciousness. And Srila Prabhupada was kind enough to give us all initiation. We were a number of people who got initiated that time during Srila Prabhupada's visit. Srila Prabhupada didn't meet any of us individually. He didn't, you know, he, he we were so, so, we were, I was 21, Prabhupada was in his 70s, mid-70s, and Prabhupada, his whole life had been a Vaishnava, and I'd been in maybe a, a few months, I'd been a devotee, so I didn't know very much. So I, I would just try to hear Prabhupada speak, and Prabhupada would talk. He liked to talk, he liked to tell us. He would tell us different things. One day I was on a walk with him in, the, in a big park in London and he saw some people sleeping in the park and the policeman was kicking them. <laughs> you know, the policeman was kicking them, get up, you're not supposed to sleep here. So Prabhupada said, you see? He said, these people, they have homes, they have money, they're from good families, but they're sleeping in the park. And then Prabhupada narrated a pastime about Lord Shiva. He said, one time Lord Shiva was with his wife Parvati and they were coming through the marketplace when a beggar approached them. And Parvati felt compassion on the beggar and she requested Lord Shiva, we should help this person, give him something. But Lord Shiva said to his wife, well, you know, this is his karma. We can't really change his karma for him. He's in that position. Anyway, he wanted to show his wife the situation, so he arranged, he produced a fruit, papaya. And within the fruit, he put a valuable necklace. And then he gave the fruit to the beggar. So what did the beggar do? The beggar took the fruit and went and sold it for a few paisa, not knowing that there was a valuable necklace within the fruit. And Lord Shiva turned to his wife and said, you see, you can't change this person's karma. They have, they're in that unfortunate position and you can't change them just by giving them some charity. So Prabhupada would tell us these different things from time to time. He, he liked to explain Krishna consciousness to us in relation to the world around us. So Prabhupada gave us initiation. We had initiation at that time, not on Janmashtami, I think maybe it was on his, the day of his Vyasa Puja, I can't remember now. But anyway, he came and sat in the temple room and he chanted, he personally chanted on our beats. He would chant one round on each of our beats and give us the beats. And he call, we would be called forward. And when we offered the basinses, he would say, 
say the pranam mantra aloud. <laughs> he wanted to hear that we knew his pranam mantra. So he said, when you come and offer obeisances to the spiritual master, you should offer the pranam mantra aloud. Don't just mumble, don't just offer in your mind. He said, I want to hear. So we had to come one by one and we would each sit in front of Srila Prabhupada and he would ask us, so what are the four regulated principles and how many rounds will you chant? And then he would say, your name is and give us the beats. So in this way we got initiation. However, after the initiation ceremony was over, that that night, or maybe it was the next morning, Prabhupada called the temple president to his room. Temple president was a devotee, an American devotee, who had joined in Los Angeles, and he'd come to help us in England. So Prabhupada called him to his room and he said, you know, he said, you know, I gave these men initiation. We were all men. Don't, there was no lady that, all young men, we're all young. <laughs> Maybe I was older, I was, I was 21. <laughs> but uh, anyway, we, we, he said, I give, I give these people initiation. He said, none of them gave me any donation. I didn't get any guru dakshin from any of them. And Prabhupada, uh, the, the temple president said to Prabhupada, he said, Srila Prabhupada, they don't have any money. <laughs> he said, they don't, they don't have any money, that's the position. He said, what well, if they did have any money, they already gave it to the temple. And the temple spent it, he said, we are just living from day to day here in the temple. We don't have money and the devotees themselves also, they don't have money. And so Prabhupada just kind of smiled and thought, he said, yeah, this is England, this country, useless country, <laughs> no wealth, no money, people are all poor. Uh, anyway, we went out that day on Harinam Sankirtan and distributed books and whatever money we were able to collect, we put it together and we gave it to Srila Prabhupada as some kind of offering for Guru Dakshi. But Prabhupada could also understand just like later on, I heard a similar thing from Bhakti Charu Maharaj. Bhakti Charu Swami Maharaj, he wrote his book about his pastimes with Srila Prabhupada and he described also when he was initiated, he didn't have any money, he didn't have anything to give Srila Prabhupada, but he did apologize to Srila Prabhupada. And, but Srila Prabhupada told him, he said, that's all right, he said, you're giving your life. So, you know, I feel this is why I'm still in the Krishna Consciousness Movement, because I'm still a debtor to Srila Prabhupada. You can never repay the debt to the spiritual master with all the wealth in the 14 worlds. So I'm, you know, it's like Krishna told the gopis, there's no way I can ever repay you, naparaiham. So I can never repay the debt to Srila Prabhupada that he gave me Krishna Consciousness. So I always feel very much indebted, very much obliged to him and uh, I, there's no way I can ever repay that debt. All right, so maybe I'll stop here and just ask if there's any questions. Thank you Maharaj for the wonderful and connected class today. Uh, any new case, if you have any questions, please unmute yourself and ask Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Uh, Maharaj, um, I was really, um, was in the different world, um, saying Prabhupada always for us, um, uh, the memory, uh, obviously the, the way you experience look like Prabhupada is in front of us. So Prabhu, uh, Maharaj, uh, if you could share 
a small glimpse when you saw Prabhupada the first time. How was your experience? <clears throat> well, when I saw Prabhupada physically for the first time, it was in the airport in London. It was in the middle of the night. Prabhupada was coming, uh, maybe from America probably. And we went to the airport. It was in the middle of the night and Prabhupada came out from the customs and the arrival hall and we were all waiting outside. So as soon as Prabhupada came out, we all fell on the floor. We all offered full obeisances right there in the airport lobby hall. Everyone was down on the ground offering obeisances. And Prabhupada came out and he saw us all and he just nodded his head and smiled a little bit, then got in the car and went to the temple. So he went to the temple immediately. He, would, he used to stay with us in the temple, although we had only a, we didn't have a big place, we had a small place. It's an interesting story actually about that because what happened, the devotee came from Los Angeles and he saw, he saw the temple and and he saw Prabhupada's room and he said, and he saw our own facilities. He thought that we were very lacking in space and facilities. We needed a bigger place. At this time, we didn't have the Bhaktivedanta Manor. But this time, we were still living in number seven Bury Place in central London. So it's a small place, very small, confined area. And Prabhupada had one floor. And, you know, we were all living at the other places. And we, we didn't have money to rent anything else, so we all live together when you come. However, Prabhupada wrote back to him and said, I don't like to stay in hotel. I like that room in the temple. I want to stay in the temple. So that was a very endearing thing to hear from Prabhupada. You know, Prabhupada liked some, although our facility was very limit but still he appreciated it and he liked to be with the devotees and he didn't like the thought of living in a hotel. Uh, so Prabhupada came back from the airport, went to his room and of course he didn't take rest, he stayed up and when we came back from the airport then we would go into Prabhupada's room for a little while we sat there and we sat there and Prabhupada would talk a little bit and just see the different devotees. And he, you know, he knew we were all very new and young. And he was happy to see us and he would like give everybody a little bit of fruit or some little bit of prasadam. And just be talking to each to the devotees. And he'd talk a little bit. If he knew some of the devotees, of course he, he would be more intimate with them. And then he would tell us, okay, go and take rest. Tomorrow we'll have program. Because it was the middle of the night, late at night. And so it, he sent us to take rest next morning, morning program. So that was the very first time we saw Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada, is, uh, his presence, physical presence, wasn't... You know, he wasn't very tall, his stature was quite small, but he was spiritually powerful. We could feel the power, just seeing him was very powerful. The vibrations coming from the energy which he created was very powerful. And so we, autom we were automatically inspired to give great respect to him and to worship him. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna. Maharaj, this is Dinesh. Maharaj, uh, my kind request is, question is, that you very, at the age of, very young age of 21 years old, you gave up the job and uh, you uh, joined the temple and you were staying in the temple. Uh, how, how it happened that uh, you, are, you are having a job and everything you were doing, 
but then uh, gave up everything and just joined uh, Srila Prabhupada. Yes. Uh, as I said, I was looking, I was a spiritual seeker. As a student, I had been reading different books of different gurus, and I was even thinking about taking initiation from one. But I, I didn't, I didn't actually get initiation. I was thinking about it, and uh, then, it, then after I finished my studies at college and graduated, then took a job in London, and I was, I purchased a Krishna book. And then the, my friend also had another book, which he gave me, the topmost yoga system. And, and then from these books, we got, I got inspired. My friend also, we both went and we both joined the temple. We went there. We went to the temple. I, I would go there and visit. I was visiting and I was going in the evening for RT and I would enjoy the evening program. We would have an ecstatic kirtan and they would give me some prasada. And oh, oh, we would have an ecstatic kirtan, there would be a class and then they would give me a bit of prasada. And then after coming, I was coming regularly, then they, they told me, they said, you know, you can stay overnight, we have a morning program. And so I thought, okay, you know, I could do that. And I stayed overnight and I go to work in the morning. And so I, I would I'd go to the Mongol Arti and, uh, and then there, would, there wasn't much of a morning program in those days. But anyway, whatever there was, I would go off to work and they'd keep some prasadam for me in the evening when I came home, I could take some prasadam. So after doing that for a few, for a few weeks or so, not very long, then they told me, they said, you know, you should give up this job and just become, because, you know, you could do service here. There's so many things to be done here in the temple that why you have to go to that job? And so I thought, yeah, it sounds like a good idea that Krishna arranged that, you know, I could also, that I should also give up the job. And I thought, you know, I, I can learn so much more by being a devotee I'm not learning much in my job, but if I become a devotee, I can learn a lot more things. I can learn cooking, for example, and I can learn this philosophy of the Bhagavad Gita and many other different things which are there in Krishna consciousness I can learn. So I was inspired. I took. You know, I thought, what jobs, you know, you can always get another job. Why are people so attached to their jobs? You need a new job? You can always get jobs. You never know when you're going to get laid off anyway. You may lose your job. You look for another job. You know, why worry about jobs? I thought, I wanted to do this. I wanted to take up Krishna consciousness. Before, become, before becoming a devotee, you know, as, as a student, I was interested, I wanted to do voluntary service in third world countries. I wanted to, I thought that... Maharaj, if I can ask one more question. Yes. Uh, if, Maharaj, in, in the Leela, when Lord came as uh, Sri Krishna and uh, Balram, Lord Balram came, so does he came same year, just eight days before? And whether Lord Balram was any time getting angry on Lord Krishna in his past times? Yes, about second question. The first question, I don't know. You asked me, was it the same year? <laughs> I don't know about that. It may have been the same year, it may not. I don't, I don't know. I've never heard anyone really discuss this. It's an interest. I, I thought about this myself, but I, you know, nobody's ever really uh, spoke about this. How much older, in terms of years, is Balaram to Krishna? Hmm. But the second question, does Balaram sometimes get angry at Krishna? Externally, it appears like Balaram is angry with Krishna. For example, when... Uh, 
Subhadra was kidnapped by Arjuna. Balarama actually was planning to have Subhadra married to Duryodhana. But Subhadra, actually she didn't like Duryodhana. The thought of her, you know, Subhadra is Yoga Maya. And Duryodhana, who is Duryodhana? You know, he's... Uh, <laughs> What is his identity? No. Anyway, he's not a not a very great personality like Subhadra. They're not. It's not a good match. But Balaram was thinking that maybe Subhadra could marry Duryodhana. But Arjuna, when he saw Subhadra, he was very attracted to her. And Krishna also thought it was a nice match. But Arjuna, he has to, you, you, he, they, they had to make some arrangement. He, he couldn't just go in because it was, uh, oh, there was already some plan there for Subhadra to marry. So uh, Arjuna disguised himself as a sannyasi and he was coming to the palace in Dwarka and they were honoring him as a sannyasi. And then after a number of visits, Subhadra was becoming attracted to the sannyasi. She didn't actually know it was Arjuna, but she was in becoming attracted to the sannyasi. And then Ar Arjuna understood this was the right time and he, he just kidnapped her. And when, well Arjuna first of all revealed himself as Arjuna, and then he came and picked up Subhadra and took her off and showed himself as a Shantra. He wasn't a sannyasi. And was very, he was quite angry that, whoa, what is this? This, this is Arjuna, how he could do like this? And he's taken Subhadra. And so Balaram was angry a little bit, quite angry actually, that this Arjuna, this a rascal, he's cheated, he's, it's not proper. But anyway, because Lord Krishna thought it was a good arrangement, then Balaram calmed down and he accepted. He was her brother. And so what can Krishna do? He, he just keeps quiet. He doesn't say anything. <laughs> and Lord Balaram, he, he has that kind of right. He can do these things. Sometimes he pleases Krishna and sometimes Sometimes there's some problems, even like the Shaimantaka jewel, there was some problem there, there was some doubt what happened to the Shaimantaka jewel. And there was some doubt about it. And people were talking, they thought that Krishna has actually taken it. Actually, Krishna hadn't taken it. But people doubted the character of Lord Krishna. So Lord Krishna had to go and find the jewel and bring it back to all to prove to all the people. So even Lord Balaram was a little suspicious about Lord Krishna. But Lord, Lord Balaram's always a servant of Lord Krishna. He always remembers his position to be the servant. Of course there was the battle Bhima and Duryodhana at the end of the battle of Kurukshetra and Bhim hit Duryodhana below the belt. It was not really a, a fair blow. Lord Balaram was not happy about it. But Lord Krishna had told him, and therefore what can be done? And so it's all rasa, really. It's just for rasa, to make the, these different pastimes more interesting, that we hear the different leelas going on, the different emotions, the interactions between the different people. But ultimately the dominant mood in Lord Balaram is the servant of Lord Krishna in everything. He's always the servant of Lord Krishna. Mm -hmm. Thank you Maharaj. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you so much.
for joining with us and accepting our invitation. Uh, Maharaj, uh, really sorry. Actually, we want to serve you directly, but uh, unfortunately, everything is uh, virtually. So before you leave, we want to offer prasadam also, Maharaj, virtually. So please forgive us. We want to serve you directly. <laughs> Request for uh, the. Deepak Joshi Prabhu and Her Grace Ratri Pini Mataji, can you please uh, offer Prasadam to Maharaj? Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept Hare. our respectful obeisances, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Oh, very nice. Oh, wonderful. Maharaj, this is uh, because Unam special, so these are the uh, Prasadam offerings. Please accept this. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Looks very delicious. <laughs> very kind of you. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Because unfortunately, we couldn't have uh, been able to serve you directly, Maharaj. No, it's okay. Just as we heard, you can offer to Krishna in the mind. So, this is even better than in the mind. With, I can eat with my eyes. Yes. It's, you are so merciful, Maharaj. It's very, Thank you so much. It's very healthy. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Thank you so much. I request all the devotees, please kindly put on your uh, video so that uh, Maharaj can bless all the devotees. Yeah, pretty much they're there. Please, Maharaj, give all of us blessings so we can also progress in Krishna consciousness, Maharaj. Oh, yes. I'm sure you'll progress very nicely. You have a nice group here, nice association. Very good. So many devotees, yeah. What, which is this, Dhamma uh, Sorry, Maharaj. Where, where are you? Gaurangadesh. Oh, Gaurangadesh. Okay, Gaurangadesh. Yeah, many times uh, you visited Maharaj, we got an opportunity to associate with you. Yes. But uh, this is the first time we are uh, meeting through Zoom. Really? This is the first time on Zoom with you, huh? Yeah, yeah. But uh, many devotees are, uh, you, uh, under your guidance, many devotees are joining for uh, Bhakti Vaibha, Bhakti Shastri and Lord Maharaj. Okay, good. Good. So maybe I'll meet you sometime. I'm still teaching these courses. Yeah, we have, we have to keep busy. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Krishna. Peace on us, Bhakti, Vikna, Vinasa, Narasimha, Swami Maharaj, Chai, Chai, Srila Prabhupada, Chai, Chai, Hare 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 Bo. Hare Bo. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prabhu. Nice to have your association. Hare Please have a nice festival. Hare Krishna. Hey.